Well, it's good to be up here with you again this Sunday. Uh, and we are going to be closing off our series on our real life vision. Uh, this is the vision of Willow Park Church. Uh, the real part is an acronym uh, for redeemed, empowered, uh, active, and listening life. And so today we're going to be looking at the listening life portion of uh, this vision and whatnot and talking about the importance of prayer. And we are really, if you know our church well, this is what we really lean into. If you know Pastor Phil well, this is, uh, he's a prayer walker, he's a prayer journalist, he's a prayer champion, and so this is where we believe everything begins. And for our church, it starts with prayer. And so we're going to be looking at... um, there's many topics that we can talk about on prayer. I mean, we can talk about unanswered prayer. Does prayer really change God's will? Like, uh, there's lots of questions in prayer, but our goal today is to encourage you and to empower you in prayer. Uh, a couple things uh, for you as uh, resources that I have found valuable. I'm not sure if you will find valuable, but uh, an opportunity for you to... Um, you know, maybe add to your library and to uh, grow a bit deeper. Uh, this prayer book, uh, it's a, a diary of a private prayer. Uh, it, it's a great uh, book for you to incorporate into your prayer life. It's got a morning, uh, midday, and evening prayer rhythm that you can follow. And so uh, we're going to see even today as we look at the story of Daniel, that Daniel even followed that model himself. And so this is a great book, uh, really easy to read. Uh, it provides a prayer each and every morning and each and every afternoon and evening. So I encourage you to pick up that book. It is right, well, this is my book. You can steal it. Uh, and so I'll leave it there. I'm just kidding. <laughs> First person to come up? No. Um, the second book, and I found it really, really valuable. It's this one, Praying Like Monks, Living Like Fools. What an amazing title. And so uh, I encourage you to grab this book too. And so this book is a great book, and it talks about rhythms of prayer, uh, and how it's meant to be relational. It speaks to the wonder and mystery and power. Uh, the wonder and mystery of prayer. It talks about answered, unanswered prayer, and the tension even between that. Uh, it reminds us of this, though, uh, as we read that, about that unanswered and answered prayer. And we'll talk about this more at the end. Uh, there's a scripture in Revelation that says those prayers that feel like they're unanswered, you know, they're being stored up in a bowl, and they're going to be poured out uh, on those last days. And so what does that look like? I don't know. But there's a recognizing that, you know what, our God's a God of redemption, and he is a God of revelation. And you know what, uh, even those, those tough things that we feel, you know, there's still hope as we continue to see throughout Scripture. So you'll find that I'll quote this book a bit today. But today we're going to look at the story of Daniel and story of Daniel in the lion's den. Now, this is the classic, everyone's favorite story. You know, at some point, this was your top one, two, three stories. Maybe it still is. And so we're going to see what Daniel did in the midst of this. And obviously, with the topic, we know what he's going to do. But... Prayer is meant to do a couple things. First thing is it's meant to show our love uh, to a loving, living, powerful God. That's the first thing about prayer. That's what, what, when we pray, it's saying, God, I love you. I'm coming to you. You're wonderful. You're powerful. You're loving. I'm coming to you with everything, and I want to be in your presence. And quote that says, before prayer is about power or outcomes or heavenly armies and a righteous uprising, it's about love. It's the way we freely choose the God who freely choose us first. That's where it starts at. You know what? We want the uprising. We want the revolution. We want to see, you know what, his kingdom come. But first and foremost, it's about coming to the one who first loved us. That's what prayer is about. We pray to show we always need God. We pray to surrender to God's plan. But we're going to see more about what Daniel's going to do in this prayer journey in the lion's den. And so... If you will, why don't you turn with me to Daniel 6, uh, verses 1 to 10. If you don't have your Bible, if you don't have the Bible app on your phone, uh, it's going to pop up here in the screen, and we're going to work through it. Now, it pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom, with three administers over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators 
and the satraps by his exceptional qualities, that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. At this, the administrators and the satraps uh, tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel and his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. So these administrators and satraps went as a group to the king and said, may King Darius live forever. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisor, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days, except to you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now your, majesty, is, now, your majesty, issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered, in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put the decree in writing. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to the upstairs room where the windows opened towards Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, give thanks to his God, just as he had done before. All right. Here's the story. So Daniel is one of three leaders under Darius's uh, rule, and it, Daniel has done a great job. He does so well at Darius, where he wants to set him above all the kingdom, give him rule over the kingdom. And this didn't sit well with the other two administrators, and they wanted to get Daniel out of office. So they did the age-old practice of slam ads that was about to start. And so they're looking for whatever they can, you know, what to find up against Daniel, you know, what he did in elementary school, you know, he pulled the, you know, some girls' pigtails and stuff like that. And so, uh, so these, they looked for skeletons in Daniel's closet, what was happening. They're like, we've got to find some dirt on him. But Daniel was such a faithful man that those who looked for a flaw in his actions or his character, they came up empty. Sometimes today, a candidate or a nominee for political office is set under this kind of scrutiny. But imagine looking as hard as you can at a public servant in office for some 50 years and finding nothing wrong. No fraudulent expense accounts, no intern scandals, no questionable business deals, no gifts from lobbyists, uh, no accusations from his staff. The 100th U.S. Congress had 29 arrested for spousal abuse. Seven convicted of fraud, 19 arrested for writing bad checks, 117 bankrupted two or more businesses, 14 arrested on drug charges, eight arrested on shoplifting charges, 21 with lawsuits against them, 84 charged with driving while intoxicated. America, home of the land and the free and the beautiful. <laughs> Don't we just love America? My home. <laughs> so, but Daniel, he was faithful. Daniel was faithful. Nothing against him. Nothing like that. My father-in-law, he had this uh, vehicle, this Ford Tempo. Uh, at one point during his life with this Ford Tempo, he had it longer than he had Johnny, who was his youngest, youngest kid. Uh, and so it was pretty much like the third kid in the family, uh, behind, you know, at Cheryl and Kim. It was his faithful vehicle. It had over 500,000 kilometers on it. Nothing flashy. Faithful was there for him until old faithful lit on fire one day and eventually went to go be, you know what, with the junkyard with the other vehicles. And so Daniel has been faithfully serving the Lord for a while now. He's faithfully serving the Lord. And through the reigns of a third king, not much has changed in Babylon. Kingdoms have come and gone. Rulers were still idolatrous. Israel was still not following the Lord. They weren't doing well. But Daniel was faithful. And I'm sure he wanted to be splashy, but he wanted to be faithful in response to a faithful God. Daniel was mimicking what he saw in God. God's faithful to me. I'm going to be faithful to him. I'm going to be faithful to him. I'm going to spend time with him. I'm going to replicate this relationship that he has shown to me as someone being faithful. Daniel knew if he was faithful in his dealings and in his prayers, a faithful God was there on the other side when things would actually come against him. So through his faithfulness and his honesty, we see this jealousy begin to rise up with these two administrators, and they are able to sweet talk King Darius into creating a law where he can pray, where no one can pray to a God or man except only to King Darius, only to him. 
So Darius, right, he succumbs to this flattery, and he agrees to this law. Now, this law, it couldn't be changed. Once it was set, it could not be changed. It was an established principle in the Medo-Persian Empire that when a king formally signed and instituted a decree, it was so binding that not even the king himself could change it because it's towards the gods. The decrees of a Persian king were unchangeable because he thought to speak for the gods would, who could never be wrong and thus never needed to change their mind. So he's speaking for the gods and he's like, if I change it, then I'm speaking as if I am God and the God's wrong. So it was more binding than a pinky square or like a spit handshake. You know one of those? You know, so if you're a parent, you know that those are the high, most highly binding agreements that you can ever make with a child. And so the pinky swear, the spit shake. And so, um, but whoever broke this law, though, was now to be cast into the lion's den. Verse 10 is where the story now gets interesting, where it begins, where we see what Daniel's going to do. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened towards Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks. Um, here we go. No, never mind. <laughs> giving thanks uh, to his God, just as he'd done before. Now, when we see this, we're like, yes, the decree has been made. Daniel, he is going against it. Let the revolution begin. Here we go. This is what we all long for. This is what we want. But what we forget is that there is actually a relationship between Darius and Daniel. There's actually a respect between these two. Daniel prays in front of his window as he normally does. The administrators see him there as they normally do because they know that's what he did. And they tell Darius what has happened. Darius respects Daniel and cares for Daniel, and likewise. There's a relationship there. Daniel doesn't pray to show his disrespect for Darius. He's not praying to be like, I don't respect you at all, Darius. But his respect for God is higher than that of Darius. And you can feel the tension of a relationship that has been deceived. We see there is respect between Darius and Daniel. When Darius finds out that Daniel has prayed, he isn't upset with Daniel. He's actually upset with himself. He's not like, Daniel, what are you doing? Darius knows. He's like, darn. Because he knows there's a relationship. He has care for Daniel. He has respect for him. He isn't upset because Daniel has prayed to someone other than him, the king. He is upset with himself because he knows he's been deceived. He knows what he has done. He knows he could lose a faithful man now. No anger towards Daniel, but only towards himself. And so what we see from Daniel's prayer life is that it is very disciplined, which is why I recommended this book. We said there's a, there's a rhythm, this three times a day rhythm of prayer in this book that gives you each and every day. Daniel, he continued the rhythm of being disciplined in his prayer life, even though there was a decree against him to do it. And the decree came, and Daniel continued his normal prayer life. He didn't pray more. He didn't pray less. Daniel just continued in his excellent, disciplined prayer life. He just continued to do what he always did. I know what's been said, but this is what I'm doing. This is my prayer life. This is, I need this. I need to come to the Lord. We talk about making the balance of being religious and relationship. We might think that, you know, is this a bit religious? Three times a day, he just continues to do it, following a set of rules. But in fact, this is Daniel just engaging in relationship, recognizing his sustenance only comes from communion with God. And so the most important discipline that we have is meeting with God every day. That is the most important discipline that you can put into your life, to meet with God every day. If you can go through your life saying, you know what, I've done that. I've spent time. I've, each and every day, I've made the space to spend time with God. That is the most important thing to do. Nothing, absolutely nothing, was able to keep Daniel from his time of prayer. Not even a death sentence attached to an irrevocable decree that could not be changed. Now, with that in mind, Let's think of the excuses that maybe stop us from a faithful, consistent prayer life. 
listen, I'm not out here to point fingers. There's like 17 pointed at me. You know, I, I got to get work done. You know, I, I look down in stairs in my basement. I easily get distracted by things that I could fix or do. Or you know what there is, I need more sleep. Or life is too busy. Listen, our Septembers are busy. They're really exciting, lots of fun, but there's lots going on. Really busy. Or you know what, life's demanding. Or you know what, my kids are demanding. What keeps us from it? There's a death decree against Daniel, but it did not keep him from meeting with God. See, consistency isn't boring. Being consistent shows that you are faithful. You are a faithful, faithful follower. Daniel's disciplined prayer life prepared him for what was coming next. So let's think about this for a minute. It wasn't just that Daniel wasn't afraid of lions or had some super courage that mere mortals, you know, could never hope to attain. Daniel had started this regular practice much earlier in his life that helped him face this impossible situation that he was in front of. To others, prayer might seem, have seemed insignificant. But to Daniel, it was a discipline that shaped his story. This is who he is. This is what he wants to do. We don't know how many years Daniel had been practicing this habit, but three times a day, every day, Daniel stopped, looked toward heaven, and he worshiped God. Daily disciplined. He constantly did that. He aligned his heart with God's heart. He sought God's will be done through his life. Because of Daniel's consistent and prayerful focus, he grew as a follower of God as a person, and he grew as a leader. He wasn't an overnight success. He was able to stand tall because he'd faithfully knelt before his one true God. The small daily discipline of prayer equipped him to face the big, scary test of those hungry lions, both the peers who were attempting to destroy him as well as those cats that were in the arena. Starting something small and then faithfully continuing it made his story so rich that it's been now told for thousands of years now. It's still going. A story that we, maybe is even being said right now in Sunday school. I don't even know. The chances are probably like 95% because that's the, that's the story. Some might say, I pray when I need to. That's not a prayer life. That is you praying when you feel like you need help, when you're at a breaking point. Also, though, I want to say we are called to come, yes, in those needs, when we feel like we're at our wit's end, because the Lord knows we constantly need to come to him. Scripture talks about coming to the Lord, those who are weary, right? He knows that. We are too. That's not a prayer life. That's coming to the one that we need, that we know we need. Think about what a disciplined prayer life will get you. In those tough times, you'll feel prepared. In those tough times, you'll feel prepared when something comes along. I talk about art. This man, he prays. He's a prayerful man. And by all other accounts, somebody would look at art's life and they would say, you know what, That's a, he's got not a great life. But you would never know that by talking with art. He is rich with joy because of his prayer life. He didn't see himself as somebody who's lower than in a wheelchair he is full of riches because of the life that he lives in prayer the world might tell him otherwise but you would never know by talking to that man we need faithful prayerful believers we need you all to be reliable Ford tempos and so you can write that down be a reliable Ford Tempo that goes over 500,000 kilometers. That Ford is like, you know what? We can't make vehicles like this because we still need to make money. And so be, uh, be like Ford Tempos. So we also see that this, that Daniel's prayer life was characterized by defiance. Defiant prayer. Now, defiant of what? Of Babylon's laws not to obey God? Yes. But there's something more in Daniel's prayer life. When Daniel prayed, he was defying a situation he didn't want to be in and that he believed God wanted to change. Like Daniel could have prayed out on the street and had a very public prayer meeting and said, let's start the revolution. Here we go. Everyone who is hearing this defiant prayer point, yes, like, yes, where is my pitchfork? And here we go. But this isn't what I mean by defiant prayer. This isn't the defiant prayer that I'm talking about. Would you have felt like Daniel was a bad boy 
if the scripture said he prayed quietly to himself in his bathroom for 30 days, we'd be like, ooh, Daniel, you're a big bad boy. <laughs> you're praying in your bathroom, hidden away from everybody. It's the words of Daniel's prayer that were defiant. The words of one of Daniel's prayers that he prayed three times a day are given in Daniel 9. This is what he prayed three times a day, every day. In Daniel 9, 17 to 19, it says, Now, our God, hear the prayers and petitions of your servant. For your sake, Lord, look with favor on your desolate sanctuary. Give ear, our God, and hear. Open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. We do not make requests of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. Lord, listen. Lord, forgive. Lord, hear and act for your sake, my God. Do not delay because your city and your people bear your name. This is a defiant prayer. And in this prayer, we see a couple things. We see a spirit of repentance and humility. We see an awareness of the promises of God. When Daniel demands in that scripture, O oh Lord, pay attention and act, your city, it's a near verbatim quote of a promise that God made all the way back in Deuteronomy 30, that if Israel went to exile, when they repented, God would restore them to Israel. So what's Daniel doing in this prayer? He's holding God's word up to God. He's saying, hey, I know what you've said. This is what you said, and he's reminding him of it. Effective prayer begins when you perceive the gap between the situation between where a situation is and where God wants it to be. When you that's defying prayer. You are defying that gap. You are saying, I'm praying into that gap. It's this way, but it's not supposed to be this way. It's supposed to be like this. And I'm gonna pray towards that because I know this is what the Lord wants. Jesus taught us this to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done as it is in heaven. And so we see a gap between his will and his kingdom in our situation. And we pray then into that gap. We pray into it. So in prayer, we perceive the will of God for a situation and we defy the situation that currently is in and we pray that God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Defying prayer, praying into that gap. In that book that I mentioned, Praying Like Monks, Living Like Fools, he talks about the Lord's Prayer, right? Your name, your kingdom, your will is in the prayer. And it says, your, 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 those statements start with. This gets us into God's reality. It gets his heavenly reality then into us while our feet remain planted on the ground. We're saying, Lord, we want your will done. Lord, we, in your name, let it be done. Lord, let your kingdom come. We're recognizing that there's a gap. Lord, we need you to come in a mighty way. This gets us into that reality. But then there's a shift in the Lord's prayer. It says, give us, forgive us, and lead us. And so it goes, us, us, us now. So we're saying, Lord, you, you, you. And we're saying, us, us, us. We are involved in the operations of God. Prayer is about partnering with God to do his work, but also to reform and work, be worked through and let the Lord's will be done now through us. And that's what we see with Daniel. He stands there and he recognizes what you want, Lord, and he prays. And when we perceive the gap in between heaven and earth, God, God is now working on us. He's now working in us. And that's what prayer is about. This is defiant prayer. Praying against the gap that you see. You are defying against the situation you see, and you pray that God will show up into the gap. Now, have you ever heard the story of John Patton? Anyone who John Patton is? John Patton, he's a Scottish pastor in the 19th century. Um, he was leading this very successful church in Scotland. He, it grew increasingly burdened. I mean, the, he grew, though, increasingly burdened about a group of of islands that he heard about in the Pacific that was inhabited by people uh, who have actually never heard the gospel. So Patton would pray for these islands, praying that they would come to know Jesus. The problem was that these islands, the New Hebrides, were filled with cannibals who had a history of eating any foreigner who came on shore. And so no Westerner knew their language. 
So like, how do you exactly start a church in a place like that, right? You're not going to have a potluck to start a church like that, right? If somebody comes in with shepherd's pie, and there's like six of them, you wonder what's in the shepherd's pie. If you know what I'm saying. What are you saying? Yeah, there's, there's a shepherd in the pie. And so, a person. Thank you, Gorin, for clarity. <laughs> but Patton knew that God was not willing that any would perish, right? He, so he's praying, your will, your will, your will, Lord, your name. He's praying into it. He sees the gap. He's drawing his heart to the Lord. But then the Lord goes, us, us, us. Then after that. A lot of time, we are the answer to our defying prayers. We have a role in helping family members come to Christ, spreading the gospel and such. Many tried to discourage Patton from going. And Patton recounts this. He said, this, I was besieged with strongest opposition on all sides. One of my seminary professors told me that I was leaving certainty for uncertainty. I was leaving work in which God had made me greatly useful only to throw my life away for the cannibals. One dear old Christian deacon said to me, son, the cannibals, you're, you'll be eaten by cannibals. That's a very logical thing to say, I guess. And so if you're going to an island full of cannibals... Indeed, he said, the opposition was so strong from nearly all that I was driven to really seek God in prayer, is what he said. But again, every doubt would vanish when I clearly saw that these poor men and women created in God's image were perishing without even the chance of knowing all of God's love and mercy. So his lifelong ministry there was brutal and exhilarating. His wife, whom he loved dearly, died bearing their first child on that island. And so he had to sleep on their graves for three to four nights to keep the cannibals away from digging them up and eating them. He was under constant siege, day and night, always on the lookout for his life, constantly on the lookout for his life. But eventually he saw a breakthrough. One of the chiefs who came to Christ asked him this. He said, when you first got here, who is that army that guarded your hut each night? Apparently, the angels of God surrounded his family each night to preserve the gospel's witness. When Patton arrived on that island in 1858, there was not a single Christian. When he died 35 years later on that same island, he said he did not know a single islander who did not profess Jesus as Lord and Savior. So where do you perceive the gap? Where are you perceiving the gap in, our, in your life in this world? in your marriage, in your kid's life, in your job, in your ministry situation, in your personal life, in your finances? Where are you perceiving the gap? And how are you stepping into it? With defying bold prayers? Asking his kingdom to come, aligning your heart with him, but then being willing to be used. Then being willing to be used. Daniel knew that praying was a defying act because he needed God to deliver Israel and only praying to God was going to do that. Now, I'm just going to close here. The last we see is that Daniel's prayer is, cons uh, is characterized by endurance. Just a sip of water. Two quick observations from Daniel's life. Daniel was willing to be thrown into the lion's den before he stopped praying. So not praying was a worse prospect to Daniel than being eaten by lions. That is a radical commitment to prayer. Just think of it. Can you say with Daniel, you will have to take my life before you take my prayer? Can you say that with Daniel? You will have to take my life before you take my prayer. How valuable is a prayer life to you? Daniel was willing to lose his life over it. How much do you prioritize it? The biggest game changer for your life, for our church, for lay country, will be a praying daily life. Uh, the president at the Bible school that we were at before we got here, his name is Brian Fuller, man of prayer. And so he was one when he said, I'm praying for you, you knew he was praying for you. But prayer walk in the morning, prayer walk at lunchtime, prayer walk in the evening, it didn't matter how cold it was in Saskatchewan. Listen, it gets cold in Saskatchewan, amen? Uh, and so minus 40, you see him out there looking like a marshmallow, <laughs> just like walking around. And so and at times you're like, 
if I hit him with my vehicle, would he feel it? And so I never told him that. And so if you're watching, Brian, I never, ever thought that. And so um, Daniel was willing, to, he was willing to persist in prayer. And it reminded me of Luke 8, 1 to 5. And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. I mean, 18, 1 to 5. He said, in a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the crazy thing from the scripture, though, is that after Jesus says this, he says, this is like praying to God. So it's like, you're saying that God is like a grumpy old judge who doesn't really care and only gives this woman what she wants because she won't stop annoying him? But Jesus' point in this story isn't to compare God to an unjust judge, but to contrast him with one. He's saying even if even an unrighteous, selfish judge who would grant answers because of persistent asking, and even if a sleeping, stingy friend will eventually give up and give up, give us our request, how much more were our Heavenly Father who does love and care for us and constantly watches over us come to us when we constantly come to Him? The woman is coming with an extravagant, bold request. And even if the stingy judge will grant the request, how much more would a loving God grant that bold request? The woman approaches as a stranger. We come as beloved children. She had no right to claim in court, we have the blood of Jesus by which we come boldly before the throne of grace. The judge that we approach is not one who doesn't care about justice or us. No, the judge we approach is a father who cared so much about us that he climbed off the judge's chair and satisfied the demands of justice so he could share with us the riches of his kingdom. So we do not need to come to Jesus as beggars. We need to come to him as children. And if you have children, you know they freely come to you. Daniel persists, he prayed persistently. Listen, as you endure with Christ, your trust in him grows. Daniel prayed for the dream to be revealed and to him, and it was. Daniel prayed faithfully to God, and his faithfulness to God was rewarded as God shut the mouths of lions. In Daniel chapter 10, we will see Daniel prays for 21 days, and his request is answered. He is met by an angel on that 21st day, and the angel actually describes the spiritual battle that took place the 20 days before he, he, had, he was able to come to Daniel and answer, help answer that prayer. He said another angel actually had to show up to help because there's a spiritual battle that, listen, we are for sure facing in this world. The picture is clear. Just, we just keep on pushing on. We keep on praying. We keep on coming to Jesus. We keep on having that relationship with him. So if you've been enduring in prayer for a loved one for 300 days, let me encourage you, keep pushing on to 301. Keep praying. Keep praying. The return from exile did not happen for some 70 years for Israel. Daniel prayed for 60 years before that answer was given 60 years. Daniel's history of enduring prayer just kept him going, kept him moving. Matthew 6 speaks of knocking, seeking, and asking. And we can take this interpretation to mean that God will answer every one of our prayers, you know, as we come to him, ask, seek, uh, knocks, seek, and ask, or ask, seek, and knock, knock, sorry. When Jesus talks about this, he isn't talking about getting everything you want. If so, like, great, all my kids today, they would be walking around with Jordans on or Crocs. <laughs> so there's a very different, they would just would love to wear Crocs all the day. Or Malachi would wish, would be six foot seven. He would be as tall as Clint. Malachi's real dream is to be the tallest person in the room. And so if uh, I would have, we'd have another Clint in our midst. And so, but asking, seeking, knocking is about relationship. Ask refers to the request that brings us to prayer. We're coming to the one. We're, we're coming with a request. Seek. Seek is throughout Scripture. Sorry, we'll get there. That often refers to God himself. Jesus is pointing us the way along the path of prayer, actually. We come asking and discovering relationship 
amidst the mess that we are experiencing right now. We're seeking something to change. We want something to change along this prayer, in our prayer. Then we get to this knock. Jesus' final verb in his teaching is about the destination of the prayer journey that begins in need. So biblically speaking, knock prompts the imagery of table fellowship. So in the ancient Hebrew world, world, acceptance, dignity, equality were given at the table fellowship. To be invited into someone's home at this time was much more about nourishment. It wasn't all about nourishment. To share a table with somebody at this time was a great affirmation of the character of that person in this truest and deepest form of intimacy. And so when somebody invited you into their home to sit at the table with you in this time, when they knocked on that door and you let them come in, it was this beautiful acceptance that you like them, that you love them, that you want to have a relationship with them, that you want to fellowship with them. And so there was intimacy attached to that. It was about having relationship. And so Jesus, he dined with everyone, sinners, right? We see that he invited everybody and everybody was invited to Jesus' table. And so when we come in prayer and when we're knocking and we're seeking, we're actually coming to the one that we are searching for. We're saying, I need you. I need to find acceptance. I need to have a relationship. And so when we ask, seek, and we knock, it's about relationship. It's not about getting what you, your desires are coming for in prayer. You find yourself at a table where you're welcomed, you're accepted, where you're loved, where you're being fed, where you're being listened to in the presence of a loving God. What I'm gleaning from this section of scripture is that there is this endurance in these acts. We are to keep on knocking, seeking, and asking, and keep on pushing through. So we keep on coming to Jesus, and then as we say, your will be done, in your name, he begins to do something within us. Worship team, you can come on up. You can just start playing. And we'll let's we stand together. The beauty as uh, we prepare to enter into worship. Why don't you stand with me? The beauty of this enduring prayer is that we keep coming to God. Our requests begin to be defined. It begins to look more and more like the heart of Christ. The more we come to Jesus, the more we welcome uh, Jesus into our lives, the more we, we begin to see that we begin to change and our request begins to line up with him. The story ends and we've heard it so many times. Daniel, he's spared in the lion's den. And we see this, King Darius, he had been all night, up all night worrying. King Darius, was, he was worrying. Daniel's in the lion's dead. He's worrying. He's just feeling for his friend. We see the enemies of Daniel, they're all up all night partying. They're having a blast. We did it. Daniel's not going to be the leader. Woohoo. Let's throw a party. Daniel appears to be the only one who actually got a good night's sleep. And he's in the midst of the worst situation of it all, right with the lions. When we are able to stand strong in prayer, we are able to stand strong in life. So when those lions, they feel like they're at you, you feel like, you know, I'm all right. You feel weak through the situation you're navigating right now? Draw close to Christ. You feel like the lions are biting you? Draw close to Christ. You feel they're hurting you? Draw close to him. I just want to close with this, and I mentioned it in the beginning. I mean, we all hear this in our prayer life, and, you know, and we think about the prayers that maybe we haven't had answered. And listen, we all have them. I mean, if we were asked to have a line, we'd all be in the line. We'd all be in that line together. But there is this beautiful scripture in Revelation that talks about that the Lord is storing up a bowl of prayers and tears. It's prayers that were answered and the tears that we maybe felt like they weren't to. But he says this, that he's going to pour out that bowl and that there will be redemption for all those. Prayers and tears. That redemption is going to be beautiful. I don't know what it's going to look like, but I know it's going gonna, it's gonna to be exactly what we all need. We've all longed for what we hope for.
So what you feel like maybe isn't answered right now or has not been answered, there's a bowl stored up. Those prayers and those tears will be poured out. There will be redemption for those. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. Lord, that we see in Daniel, our prayer life is meant to be like this disciplined, defiant, enduring prayer life. Lord, we want to constantly recognize you. Lord, that's what this prayer life is about, coming to the one that we love. And we ask, we seek, and we knock because it's about relationship. It's not about what we're we are so asking you, but it's about what we're actually entering into, that we now get to dine at the table with Jesus, the one who loves everyone that we see throughout scripture. He loved the poor and the weak, and that he accepts us, and that he wants to hear us, and he wants to talk with us, and he wants to love and comfort us. So that's what prayer does. It draws us close to him. But we also get this defying moment where we say, Lord, let your will be done. We have to be open to what he wants us to do in that defiance. So Lord, we thank you for this. We thank you that we can come to you. In your name we pray. Amen.